So today we have Ryan Price. He's the creative director for the Sacramento Kings. And what drew, really drew me to asking Ryan to speak was the fact that he's responsible for the biggest brand in town, but he still manages to keep a pretty low profile around here. Except for the whole being named Ad Person of the Year <laughs> by Sacramento Ad Club. You don't really hear much about him. Ryan joined the Kings as creative director in 2014, and with his advertising background built an in-house creative team, it functions similarly to an ad agency model. In three short seasons, he's managed to build a strong, award-winning team that's focused on pushing the Kings brand to the next level. Really excited to hear from him today. Please help me welcome Ryan Bryce. Yo, everyone hear me okay? Uh, is everyone properly caffeinated? We feeling okay? I always, I always feel like creative mornings is kind of funny, right? Because we're not really, creatives aren't necessarily morning people. Um, it should be more like creative late afternoon <laughs> sort of a thing. Um, and I'm totally going to do this right now. We're going to take a photo. Let's do this for Instagram, okay? All right, so on the count of three, we're going to go, hey, all right? All right, one, two, three, hey! All right, you guys look great. All right, uh, Rebecca, thank you. Um, it's always a little surreal to have someone introduce you um, and summarize your, uh, your career in just a few short lines, but um, I think she did uh, a really good job, made me sound probably better than I, I really am. Um, and props to all of you guys. I gotta say, this is a really cool thing that happens in our community every month, and you guys are here taking advantage of that, and I think it's really cool that creatives can get together, they can network, they can um, you know, connect and share ideas and, um, and really sort of establish this community, and I think that this is um, a really cool thing. So props for being here, props to your employers for, um, yeah, letting you sneak away from, from the office. Um, I hope that I can be inspiring today. Um, this is a challenging topic, so thanks a lot, Moscow Creative Mornings team. Um, and I, but I'm up to the challenge. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to start here. Pretty handsome fella. So this is my, this is my brother-in-law. So my wife's, uh, my wife's sister married this guy, um, and he... Uh, at the time when they got engaged, he was a high school football coach at like the lowest level, um, sophomore, sophomore team. And this is in Utah, so high school starts at the sophomore level. So he's at the bottom of the barrel. He's, you know, he's barely scraping by. He's barely making sort of any kind of um, income. And he meets my sister-in-law. They get engaged, and he he kind of realizes that. This is a long. This is a long road that he has ahead of him, and I think that he wanted to become a. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that he wanted to become a uh, a professional coach at some level, whether it's college or even in the pros. And um, he came to the realization that uh, you know this is going to be difficult and it might not happen, and that financially he would have uh, challenges supporting. Uh, a new wife and one day a family. So he reevaluated, and he and his fiance um, had a conversation. And she asked him, "Well, what what else would you want to do?" And he said, "Video games. It'd be really cool if I could make video games." And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to hear that conversation and see her face and just be like, "I'm sure it was just like, what? Are you serious? Video games?" Um, but it was something that he was passionate about. He loved video games since he was a kid. And so they did research. And when I say they, it was really her. Um, she went out and she went out and she tried to find a, um, a university that offered a program. And she found one that was really great. Quinn applied. He got in. He did really well. He graduated and he got a job in, um, in, video, in the video game industry. Um, and I, I think it was really interesting, like he, he got a job instantly, um, and that job led to an even better job, and that job led to an even better job. And today, he is the lead designer for a company by the name of 343 Industries that makes the game Halo, which you may have heard of. So let me, let me show you where Quinn is today. This is a screenshot of his Twitter account. Um, I wanted to point out 
Look at that. He's got 20,000 followers on Twitter. That's probably more than all of us combined in this room, unless there's some kind of superstar that I'm not aware of that's here. Um, so, look, I mean, he's practically like some kind of uh, video game superstar or something. Um, here he is with Conan O'Brien, helping Conan O'Brien in a video game skit on the show Conan. And here's my favorite, chilling with that rapper Ice-T right in the middle. So awesome. Um, so you're probably wondering why I'm going into detail about somebody else, um, my brother-in-law. Um, and you know, he doesn't know this, but I th he was actually a huge inspiration for me. He, um, he, he doesn't know this, and I'll have to send him the video. Thanks, Quinn. So, um, <laughs> he, uh, he went out and found his passion, and he's super good at it. He's, um, he's doing really well, he loves it, he's passionate about it, and I think that, for me, was really inspirational. So I'll, I'll jump forward to where, where this sort of connects to me. Um, in 2014, I was working as an in-house creative director for a health and wellness company, and I had been out of the ad agency world for about five years, and I was liking the in-house environment. It paid really well. Um, I was able to control the brand a lot more, um, we were doing some cool things. I got to do a lot of packaging design, which is something that I found out I was really passionate about and really liked. Um, we got to do like, you know, catalog, uh, yeah, like catalog photo shoots in like really cool locations and we did some fun stuff. But after a while, um, I kind of hit the ceiling. There wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to grow, to, to continue to uh, progress in my career. And to be quite honest, I think I just hit that sort of like creative fatigue with that brand. Um, and I think that that happens to some of us. You know, we're working on something and we're putting our whole heart into it and, and then eventually you just either kind of lose that passion or run out of ideas or you're ready for something new and some, some kind of new challenge. And I kind of felt like I was there. Um, I had sort of designed everything or redesigned everything and I had kind of done everything that I wanted to do with the brand and was at that crossroads where it's like, yeah, I kind of feel like I need to move on, like it's time. Um, but I didn't know where. I didn't know, like, maybe I should go back into ad agency world. Is there another, is there another in-house job that I would even be interested in? Um, and that's when I thought about Quinn. I thought, wow, Quinn is so lucky. I can't believe he did this. He found. He found his passion. He went out and he, he recognized it. He went out and he chased it and he got it. And I thought, wow, I wish something like that could happen to me. But then I thought, well, what, what is even my passion? I think, you know, passion, I mean, my des being a designer was um, something I was passionate about and I always wanted to be a creative director. So I feel like I was doing, doing what I should be doing. I was on that path, but what, was the, what type of work was I most passionate about? Um, and I, when I had this revelation, I was, sitting, I was sitting at my desk and in my office and I had two monitors. Um, one of the monitors had the current design project that I was working on and the uh, second monitor had a website called Hoop Rumors, NBA Hoop Rumors. Now, this website is, you would never go to this website unless you were an, ur in like an uber NBA nerd. Like it's like, a, it's like a gossip site for NBA fanatics. Um, you can learn about trades that are coming up, like this player's not happy and he wants to move to this team and play with you know, whatever, and, or this team is gonna draft this guy um, this, you know, in, in the draft this summer, or you know, it's talking about how this guy has got a contract that's coming up and he's probably gonna bail and go to another team. Like it was just really nerdy stuff. And that's when it kind of hit me like, oh, wow, I really love sports and basketball in particular. Um, now, I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah, and the Utah Jazz are pretty much the only show in town. There's a couple of colleges and there's a soccer team, but the Jazz are, are kind of a big deal. And I grew up in the era where the Jazz were super good. They had two really amazing players that only uh, could lose to, only lost to Michael Jordan. So um, I was hooked at an early age. and so. Um, I really thought, wow, that, I think that's my passion. M ma um, this marriage of uh, advertising and design and sports. And so, um, I, I mean, I did the natural thing, right? I went and I, um, I Googled. 
to see if there was maybe like, maybe there's an advertising agency that specializes in sports design only. They only have clients that are sports related. Or even better, maybe there's a team that has a, a creative in-house um, team. So I did some research. The very first thing that popped up was this website that um, is it's like a job posting site for only sports jobs. Um, NFL, NBA, MLB, um, soccer, hockey, even I think some uh, D1 colleges are on there. And it's not just creative jobs, it's marketing and sales and I mean every kind of random position that you could think of that's um, at the sports level is posted on there. Um, and so I took a chance and typed in creative director and the first thing that popped up was creative director Sacramento Kings. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is insane. And I know this is gonna sound totally cheesy, but I had a really good feeling about it, like a super good vibe that this was um, something special. So, you know, I, I read the description and I, I didn't hesitate. I applied instantly and, and thankfully um, I had my portfolio ready. I had a resume ready. I just, I just went for it. Um, and that's kind of where, where it all began. Um, <clears throat> You know, I look back and I, I think, wow, this is, that, was, that was a pretty amazing discovery. Um, and this all happened in one day, this, this idea of, of thinking, wow, I wish I could find something like Quinn did. And then, you know, realizing, wow, I think that would be my passion, to work in sports, to do what I love doing for a sports team. And then finding the sort of dream job and then applying for it. And, I, you know, I say that I was that I had a good vibe about it. I knew, I know sports. Like I could rattle off all sorts of random facts. I knew Sacramento, I knew the Kings. I could tell you players from the 80s and the 90s. And I knew what Sacramento was going through with their, their former ownership and that fight uh, to save the team and the team almost leaving to a, a couple of different cities. Um, I knew that the fan base had rose up and, and miraculously you know, petitioned to try to save this team. I knew that this fan base was hardcore, that it was loyal. Um, I knew that this new owner had a great vision and that there were, there were high hopes again in Sacramento. So I apply and a couple of days later I get a phone call and I'm like, holy cow, they're, they actually, this is happening. <laughs> Um, so I had a phone call. They said that they wanted to schedule a phone interview with me and the vice president of marketing, who is Erica Rao. Some of you know who she is. So I had a call with Erica, and I got to tell you, like, it, it couldn't have gone better. Like, it was, uh, I went back home and told my wife about the call, and I was just like, I just totally hit it off with her. Um, she has this great vision. Uh, I bought into it. I thought, you know, like, she was really inspiring, and she said, that she wanted to create an in-house uh, agency style team. And I thought, that's perfect. That's what I just did in my last job. I came in and I weaned them off of a need for an agency. I built a strong in-house team. We actually had to prove our worth and compete against their creative team for a while. And we won out and we stopped using the agency. So I was like, sweet, I can do that. Let's do this. Um, she had mentioned that they were building a new arena and I knew that, but I hadn't thought about how that would impact me if I got this role as creative director. Like, wow, I would basically get to dress the arena, for lack of a better word. Um, and then she said, when we move into this new arena, we want to make a big splash. We want to rebrand the team. And I was like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> it was like, um, you know, in like movies where a grenade goes off and you hear that high pitched ring and like echoey sounds. Like, I don't remember what she said after that. I was like, <laughs> I was like already thinking in my head, oh wow, what would I do? But I, uh, you know, what could, I would bring the old colors back. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do, you know, I'm already starting to ideate and, and just, and thinking like, this is not only did I find something that I, I thought I think is going to be my passion, but it also turned out to be like a dream come true. Uh, I think every designer wants to be a part of a rebrand and then an arena and then you know, all these wonderful things that happen with that and, and discovering how uh, amazing the city is and the fan base and this connection to, to everything was just um, pretty amazing. So anyway, the phone call went really well. Um, six days later, they were flying me out for a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and I was, of course, ecstatic. And um, I came out, I saw what um, her vision was in a, in a broader perspective. And and I was totally bought in. Um, and six days after that, I was signing my um, offer letter and sending it back. And I had uh, accepted the position. 
Um, and I mean, I, I packed up my family. We moved from Utah to Sacramento. And to be honest, like I haven't looked back. It's been an amazing experience. And ladies and gentlemen, that is serendipity. <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about serendipity for a second. This is the definition of serendipity. No, this is not the definition of serendipity. Serendipity is more than dumb luck. Um, it's also more than one skill. Serendipity requires an observing eye and creative associative thinking. This is the definition of serendipity. <laughs> a state of mind whereby a person through awareness, sensitivity, and sagacity frequently finds something better than that which he is seeking. Um, this topic is, you know, I, I remember when Rebecca called me and asked me about, about speaking. I thought, wow, this, is, this would be a great opportunity. And then she told me what the topic was, and I was like, oh, <laughs> serendipity. Like, I knew that there was a movie about it. I'd never <laughs> seen it. Um, my friend Josh said I should check it out. It's pretty good. <laughs> I think he watches it every year. Um, so I did some investigating, and honestly, I feel like it's a really perfect topic. So I think er, er, uh, Rebecca was really inspired to give me this, this assignment. Um, so I want to break down this definition into three parts, and I think it will help us gain a better understanding of not just what serendipity is, but how we can sort of incorporate it into, um, into our lives and look for those opportunities that I think other people will miss. Um, so let's jump in. So I underlined uh, a state of mind. It's really, it starts there. It's a state of mind, which means an attitude and perspective. The second point, so I, I underlined awareness, sensitivity, and sagacity. And I gotta pause for a minute and say, sagacity is like the dumbest word I've ever said. <laughs> Like, it feels like something that you would get after eating some lasagna. Like, oh, I got sagacity. Like, it's just weird. But the definition actually is really cool. It means, like, discernment or, or wise judgment. So um, think about that when we, t when we talk about this word. Um, awareness, sensitivity, or discernment. So it requires awareness and sensitivity along with a thoughtful and wise interpretation of what one notices. Let's talk about the next point. So I underlined the word finds and seeking. So to me, this implies that the person is proactive because they, they're seeking things, they have goals, they're, they're on a path. And that's really where I think serendipity can happen. So I think it also indicates that life just, I mean, life just spontaneously happens. And a lot of people think that, you know, that, spon that, that serendipity can, it just happens. And it, and it kind of does, but I think you can actually be led to it. Like we, we get opportunities and we get impressions um, and ideas, and sometimes those ideas are better than what we were really seeking. Um, there's, there's this definition, this definition came from a, um, a British politician and writer in like the 1700s who discovered that the English language didn't have a, a definition for something that um, when, you're, when you're seeking something and then you find something better. So he coined the term serendipity, and it was based off of this fable uh, this old fable about the princes of Serendip. And these princes have a quest. They, they go out to find fortune, and they end up not finding fortune. They end up finding something way better than fortune. They find love, they find trust, they find opportunities to serve. And I know maybe opportuni opportunity to serve doesn't sound like that's something that's exciting, but I think um, service is probably one of the greatest um, attributes that a human can develop. You, you put off your your desires and, and your interests and become selfless and, and help somebody else. And I think that's, that's a really um, an amazing quality. So this, um, this idea of serendipity really starts with being focused and having a goal, but then being distracted a little bit and finding or being aware of other opportunities and things that come your way. And that awareness um, can lead to, to better things. And I think that these you know, these three princes that went off on this quest found something that was even better. And I think oftentimes in life, we, um, we may be on, our, on, a, on a quest for, our, for something that may have like a short-term value or um, maybe isn't as important as, as um, it really should be if you're looking at this, you know, this lifetime as a, a larger uh, space of time. But it may be important to us at the time, but then you find something that is even more, um, even more rewarding and better. Um, there was a really good quote that I found about serendipity. Let me share it real quick. It says, if we wish to cultivate the art of serendipity, we must give experts enough time to get distracted by random observations and thoughts. So 
I got to be honest, when I, when I got this topic, I tried to think of um, experiences with the Sacramento Kings that I could bring in um, and share. And it's, it's actually kind of hard to do a post-mortem on an old project and see where serendipity happened. I wanted to talk about the, the new brand, the logo, um, the logo set that we created. Uh, I wanted to talk about Sacramento Proud, one of, the, uh, one of my favorite campaigns that I've ever worked on. Um, but it was really hard to sort of identify those serendipitous moments along the way. And I think it's kind of hard in advertising in general. You know, we have this, this challenge, this creative problem, and, you know, we, we come up with an idea and it may start with a clever headline and then we get some great art direction and then we sort of build this campaign out and, you know, media is purchased and it start, you know, we start placing it and we fully expect it to do really well. So it's hard to sort of um, I don't want to discredit any of any of our projects by saying we just kind of lucked into it or we, you know, we you know, stumbled into this great idea when it, when it felt like it was really strategic and really thought out. However, I think serendipity happens at the earliest stages. Um, it's that idea. It's at the very beginning where you think maybe you have this idea. And I think, you know, some of you who are creatives, maybe designers or copywriters, and you're brought into a project and you're given this, this challenge, you know, you think... Um, you probably start thinking immediately. I do sometimes, like they haven't even finished explaining it and I'm already like on a path, like, oh, I'm designing it in my head and you know, I'm figuring out what I wanna do and I got a low battery warning on this laptop. So anyway, <laughs> it's okay, I don't need it. Um, so I think uh, it's really easy to just kind of look back and you know, you're, you're already thinking in your head and then you sit down at the computer and you're ready to design or, or create something or write something and then you get another idea somewhere. Maybe it's from talking with a colleague or, you know, even talking with marketing, which I know some creatives, it's not always um, a fun thing to do because they have crazy ideas. Um, but those, those sort of opportunities sort of present themselves on this path and you shouldn't be sort of distracted. I mean, you should be distracted and you should be able to through you know, awareness and being sensitive to things, be able to recognize when you have a better idea or when you need to switch gears and maybe check something else out. So there was one particular project that I feel like there was some connection to serendipity. Um, I think about midway through my first season with the Kings, I was called by a local artist. And I gotta be honest, like I get, I get phone calls and I get emails from um, from all sorts of random people, um, you know, wanting to, vendors that want to do business with us or um, designers inquiring about an open position. Um, and then randoms like, hey, I want to perform at halftime or sing the national anthem. And that's not even my job. I'm like, why are you calling me? Um, so they didn't call me on my work phone. They called me on my cell phone, which they found on my portfolio website, which doesn't, it's not there anymore. So don't, like that was a lesson learned. Um, so they call me on my, they call me on my cell phone, um, and uh, it's this, it's this woman who introduces herself and says that she works with this artist, and she said it like I should know him, and I'm not from here, and I didn't know. Um, I was like, <laughs> and then she kind of like tiptoed around something, like she didn't come out and ask, say, hey, like I, you know, we want to work with you, we've got this great idea. They didn't say that. She just tried to keep it casual and make conversation, but it came off really like strong. She was, she was like, hey, where do you live? And I was like, what? Why do you want to know where I live? And she's like, we should meet for coffee. And I'm like, what? I don't even drink coffee. Like, I don't know you. I'm happily married. What is, where, where is this going? Um, so I arranged to have them come to my office at Sleep Train Arena at the time. And she came with this artist. And his name is Phil America. And they came in and they sat down. And um, it turns out Phil is a great guy. He's really friendly, he's really smart, he's passionate about the art that he makes, and he's a Sacramento native, even though he spends a lot of time in LA doing shows and whatever. And even better, he's a diehard Kings fan. Um, and they talked to me about a project that they have in mind, um, and we hit it off. And we, we, we honestly became fast friends and continued to meet uh, for several, several times. And, um, he pitches this idea about these like letters that are balloons and like spelling out a word that means something to either the environment or the, uh, the surroundings or, you know, the culture or the city or something. And, um, and he wanted to get in players involved. Um, maybe we do it in arena and, you know, it just didn't feel right. Um, there was some turmoil at, with the team at the time. Um, it just was the wrong time and the wrong project, but I was so um, connected with Phil. I thought, I felt like he was, 
um, really passionate about what he did. I really wanted to work with him. And unfortunately, it just wasn't, wasn't the right project or the right time. So I kind of filed that in the back of my head, and, you know, like, let's, let's find something to work with Phil on. Um, and then uh, one day, he posts this photo on the far left. Uh, and if you can't tell what that is, it's a, a brand new pair of shoes. It's a LeBron James edition, uh, super expensive. Did I say brand new? Okay. Um, he's cutting it up with like these industrial pair of scissors. And he posts this, and I th it was actually a video. And I, I remember thinking, like, the word I, ex I used to describe this is that it's very visually arresting. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you ruining those shoes? And the comments kept rolling in that were just similar. They were like, no, what are you doing? Give those to me. Give those to somebody in need. I can't believe you're ruining or wasting those shoes. And um, he doesn't comment, and he just lets it lie. And then the next day, he posts the picture in the middle, and it was like he's cut up a bunch of shoes. <laughs> and he's starting to like color code them and sort them. And then the next day, he posts that picture on the far right, and he started to stuff them by color in these mason jars. And I, I mean, I'm in, like he had me on the first photo, like, what are you doing? Um, and then he posts the, the reveal of his art piece and he made an American flag. He obviously stacked these up, secured them on the, on the wall and made this really cool piece. And I was just so moved by it. I thought, wow, this is really dope. Um, and I shared this with the VP of marketing and I, I said, look, this guy, Phil America, he created this. We should look for an opportunity to work with him. And she was like, we totally should. We have all this old King's memorabilia. Maybe we use old basketballs and uniforms and posters and bobbleheads and we cut them up and put them in jars and do something cool. And I was like, yes, let's do that. Um, so we brought Phil back in. We talked to him about this idea. We told him about all this junk and stuff that we have that we could do something cool with. And he goes off and he starts to think and we're kind of thinking too because it doesn't feel like the idea is quite, quite baked yet. Um, and he comes back and he suggests that maybe we do the word proud or maybe we do the Sacramento skyline with some of this stuff. And we're like, yeah, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't quite feel right. Um, and at the time we were wrapping up the, the logo rebrand and in the NBA, when you rebrand, it's not just a simple, you know, flip of the switch. You, um, you know, you create this brand and then you do uniforms. And uniforms have to be produced like a year and a half to two years in advance. So we had to have this logo locked in to start the uniforms and then get the uniforms to be actually produced. So we were just wrapping up the logos and, you know, we have more than one logo. We have the primary logo, which hopefully you guys are all familiar with, and a couple of secondary marks, the lion, the sack logo, and then we also have the heralding lion, which is our, our kind of global crest, and then we have the standalone crown. The crown has actually been a part of our brand for years and years. If you go back to the Rochester Royals days, they had a shield kind of with a flag coming through it, but they also had the secondary crown that was kind of this um, weird kind of ornate crown. But we kept that as a part of our brand, and I, I thought, well, that's that's a really great representation. It's also pretty easy to do. It's not as complex as some of the other logos, and I think we could do that in this sort of format. So I think we locked in, okay, we're gonna do the crown. What's the best kind of container to do this? It, like mason jars didn't quite feel right. So Phil did some investigating and he found this great sort of plexi square uh, that was sourced locally and it worked perfectly. It was, you know, building this kind of, um, you know, this square piece. Um, but what we, did, okay, so we had this, this idea locked in, but we didn't have a spot in the arena locked in yet. Um, and this made me a little nervous. We had a couple of walls that were in mind, that we had in mind, um, but, you know, we, we talked with engineers and they're like, oh, that's not structurally sound enough to support something of this size and, and of this weight. And so we, we kind of played around with a few ideas. And, and the really challenging part was that we were still building the arena. Like we couldn't pull an engineer off of building the arena to help us figure out where we were gonna hang a piece of art. So um, there was this real challenge of like, wow, is this gonna happen in time before the arena, the arena happens? And in addition to like, we had to get buy off at the highest level. And I will say that Erica Rao is like a magician. I don't know who and how she got this approved at the highest level, um, not just budget wise, but um, to actually like get approval, like, yeah, we trust you completely. Put a bunch of old cut up shoes <laughs> on the wall, um, but she made it happen and, and I'm grateful for that. And actually one of my uh, contemporaries at, a, at the Cleveland Cavaliers was like, hey, wow, that's really cool to see that you guys have this kind of support to do really creative things. And that, 
that was uh, really meaningful to me and made me pause and go, wow, we are pretty lucky to, to have you know, the trust and respect at the highest level to let us do these kinds of things. So we engage Phil, he starts to cut up shoes. That, that photo is so random. I know he used scissors most of the time. I think he was doing this for fun to like get this butcher knife out and just dissect the shoe. Um, so he put it, you know, it's a collection of these little squares, which then are in these three different sections. And, you know, he started to color code them. He, you know, built this grid to make sure that the, the crown was accurate um, and, you know, displayed properly. Um, but where do the shoes come from? So in the old sleep train arena, there's this random section in between a couple of departments that's like a storage attic. Um, I called it the boneyard because there were all sorts of random things, old things that we didn't need anymore, and old equipment and furniture and all sorts of random junk. Um, and the, um, the foundation department, uh, who, which does a lot of our philanthropic and kind of community service uh, related stuff, has this cage of a uh, collection of King's memorabilia that they'll auction or they'll give to people. And they had this one section in that cage that was like Foot Locker. It was like all these boxes of Nikes and Adidas and um, bins of shoes and, and you know some of them were autographed and all of them were player worn or player custom shoes. Like they had even the insert that this, this, this certain player um, who was concerned about feet health had. Um, <laughs> And when I say player worn, like, I know that kind of sounds disgusting, but they were worn like once or twice and then they're done and on to the next pair of shoes. So we had all these shoes and I know that they, they saved a, f a few of them for auctions and stuff, but they also gave some away. Like if a single mom called and said, Hey, my son just keeps growing and he's got size 15. Can you help, can you help us out? Do you have any extra shoes? Yes, we have a million. <laughs> um, so Phil came in and went through and grabbed some shoes. And the great thing about the shoes was that they were on brand. We had white, we had gray, we had black and purple. Um, and the, the really cool thing about this was this wasn't just current players. This was like, we had Dada's from Chris Weber. We had like, you know, Vlade and Peja shoes and, you know, like Tyreek and Isaiah Thomas and DeMarcus Cousins and my, my boy Jimmy Fredette, yeah. Um, <laughs> So we had all sorts of stuff. So Phil came and, and he gathered them up and I, we finally had this concept that's baked, you know, where it's player shoes. We had the containment resolved and we finally identified a wall that was perfect. And um, a few weeks before it was installed, we found out that the wall was not perfect. It didn't have enough support, even though we were told that it did. So they had to add like a, an extension to the wall. So if you go to the arena and you see, um, here, I'll just, I'll show you the reveal here. This section right here was the original wall. And this is the wall that we had to build out to add more support. And that was, you know, that was some money. Um, so it barely happened. Um, literally the day before this arena was supposed to open, it's getting hung and we're just crossing our fingers the whole time that this idea of cut up shoes uh, on a wall is gonna turn out great. Um, and thankfully it did. Um, it's called, it's entitled Player Edition. It can be found in section 203. It's right around the corner from uh, Lowbrow. So grab a brat, walk around the corner. You can see it. Now you know all the information that you could ever want to know about this piece. So <laughs> you can share this story with your friends or family and, and it's kind of interesting. But to me, that I felt like there was so many serendipitous moments along the way of identifying this, um, this project. And I'm uh, sort of grateful that um, I was aware along the process to sort of recognize these and, and piece this together. Um, I think uh, in closing, I found this great quote about serendipity. Um, and I, th I think that it, it can help us as we look for these opportunities and, and, and really pay attention to the inspiration that, that hits us. Um, serendipity can be developed as an attitude of the mind and as a quality of the spirit. It can energize and excite our lives and give us balance between structure and spontaneity, between flat, fixed firmness and free, fun flexibility. It can allow us to get there and to enjoy the journey at the same time. It can tap us into a higher, clearer reality and inject joy into what is no longer the routine. So my hope for all of you is that you will get a little distracted, find a goal, stay on the path, but then Allow yourself to be aware and to look around and to find those opportunities because really seren serendipity can allow you to really experience um, some of the greatest joys in life. Thanks.